Hello everyone, a uh, very very good evening and uh, welcome to Study IQ IAS English. I hope that everybody is doing absolutely fine and uh, wonderful. So today we are going to proceed with the next lecture in our Art and Culture series where today we will be doing the topic related to the art of the Mauryan period. So as you all might be aware that uh, Mauryan age was a proliferate period in which the proper development as well as the execution of the ideas related to the sculpture art, related to the construction, they all started to develop. So in this today's lecture, we will be talking about these ideas, these aspects of the modern art and architecture. This particular topic will be covered in two distinct parts. The first part that is in today, we are going to cover the basic features of the pillar architecture and the stupa architecture. We will also try to have a brief about the palace of uh, Mauryan period. However, that is not very significant piece of architecture as far as it is concerned because uh, we only have the remnants of the palace. However, it definitely provides, it definitely provides a great trail of the cultural heritage that prevailed during the Mauryan period. And in tomorrow's lecture, the next part of it, we will be covering up about the popular arts or the folk arts. So let us proceed without any further delay. But before proceeding ahead, let me tell you a very, very important thing that the P2I batch, the prelims to interview, that basically batch is going to start from uh, 31st of August, 6 p.m. onwards. And guys, this is available in the English, English and Hindi as per your uh, preference. You can choose the batches and if you have not downloaded the application yet, go and download the application for further details. Now let us proceed. In case if you want uh, the discounted price, do not forget to use this code, right? That is very important. So I just, uh, you know, just skipped off of my mind that you have to use this code. Otherwise, you will not get this particular price discount. Now moving to the topic, modern arts. So basically, when we talk about a time period, the Mauryan time period, as we all might be aware that Chandragupta Maurya ascended to the throne in around 322-321 BCE. And in this particular period, the Mahajanapada era, the phase of second urbanization, it was already on the peak. And when we understand that when we have the urbanized features in the society, naturally we will have the more prosperity, we will have the more wealth flowing in, in the economic system and therefore when we have more prosperity, when we have more wealth flowing in the economic system, then the natural outcome of this condition will be the increasing demand, the increasing demand of the art and sculptural artifacts. Not only the art and sculpture, but also the potteries of this era, they will, they will start developing and they will start becoming more luxurious and more affluent in the appearance. When we talk about the Mauryan period, Mauryan period demarcates the emergence of the royal and the religious arts. What is the meaning of the royal and the religious arts? Good evening everybody. Royal and religious arts basically, until now we have studied about the prehistoric arts or the proto-historic arts which included the stone age period or the megalithic period or the Harappan civilization period or even the Vedic period. In this phase, there was no emergence or there was no such connection of the arts with the patronage of any ruler or patronage of any king. Neither did have, right, neither did it have any connection with the particular religion or particular faith. Whereas in the Mauryan period, we have the clear indications that the art form of the Mauryan period that had the influence of religion as well as it had the influence of the royal patronage. For example, Ashoka, he supported the construction of the Mauryan pillars. Ashoka 
facilitated the construction of the stupas in his period. Okay? This is why we can say that royal patronage was an essential part in this period. Apart from that, when we saw that royal patronage, that was uh, more important. Let us also acknowledge that in this period, not only the royal patronage, but at the same time, the flow of money in the economic system led to the prosperous merchants and prosperous trading classes. Even they also supported, they also supported the construction of the huge monuments and structures, for example, the caves, etc. Not only that, the popular arts, right, the popular arts where the people of the empire, they started constructing their own favorite, their own favorite gods, sculptures. Therefore, we will observe all these features which would include, right, which would include not only, right, not only the religious structure, but also the folk structures as well as the rock cut cave architecture, right, rock cut cave architecture, etc. Now, moving further, when we exactly try to categorize, try to categorize the Mauryan period architecture, we can categorize it in that we can categorize it into two parts, the court art and the popular art. The court art is basically, right, the court art is basically the initiative, the initiative of the royal, royal patronage. Whereas, Popular art is basically patronized and funded by patronized and funded by mostly rich merchants. Rich merchants. Okay, everyone. Now, see this particular information is really, really useful for not only the prelims but also for the mains examination. In prelims examination, there can be simply the statement that rich merchants and bankers provided the funds for the construction of popular art. Absolutely correct. However, in the mains examination, this information can become the basis of a question. For example, that uh, the emergence of the emergence of uh, Mahajanapad age, a yeah, prosperity in the Mahajanapad age, led to the consequences or led to the positive consequences on the art and culture or on the growth of art and art and culture so how can this question be formed how can this question be formed this question can be formed like that uh, see the age of yeah the rise of you know, the rise of mahajanpad the rise of uh, prosperity rise of prosperity in the Mahajanpad era, in the Mahajanpad era, led to positive consequences. Okay, positive consequences on the growth of popular art. Okay, popular arts. Now, this could be a question, this could be a well-formed question in the mains examination, which can ask you to write down uh, about in 150 words or if there is another line added to this question, it could well uh, ask you to write down in 250 words. So, depends upon this initial understanding of the particular topic. Now, moving further and let us understand, first of all, let us understand about the court architecture. The court architecture mainly had the following features. In fact, let me tell you that the court art, as I told you, that it involved the palaces, it involved the pillars, and it also involved the stupas. Okay, everyone. When we talk about the palace, guys, remember that there is a palace obtained from a place near Patna called as Kumharar called as Kumharar. Okay? 
दिस इज लोकेटेड नियर पाटलिपुत्रा और नियर पटना हाउ एवर दिस अपियर्स टू बी अपियर्स टू बी अ वुडन पैलेस अपियर्स टू बी अ वुडन पैलेस एंड ऑल्सो अपियर्स टू बी आर्किटेक्चरली इंस्पायर्ड आर्किटेक्चरली इंस्पायर्ड बाय द अकेमेनिड पैलेस बाय द अकेमेनिड पैलेस those who don't know about the akamanids let me tell you that the akamanids were basically the ruling dynasty of persia who were the predecessors as well as the contemporaries of the mauryas in india all right everyone so it is assumed by um, you know many historians that these palaces might have taken inspiration from the persian palaces as well however we don't have the you know exact evidence we don't have the exact uh, prototype of architecture here and why so because usually the palace that we have right that palace is uh, actually distorted it's completely destroyed and not only that but also this palace is basically uh, you know made by the wood so near naturally we have the we have the you know completely fossilized remains as well as the reactions which have almost eaten up the entire palace so not much is left apart from the you know fossilized uh, ground work that is left only that much is left but we have the very well preserved remains of the pillars and the stupas because both of them they are comparatively strong structures pillars they are made up of the buff sandstone also known as the chunar sandstone okay so made of the buff sandstone or chunar sandstone where is chunar located guys chunar is basically located in the district mirzapur of uttar pradesh and it is known in fact well known for its peculiar type of the sandstone which is found there right not only that it also it also has that uh, you know appearance of light creamish buff you know creamish spots on the buff colored sandstone now that is a very special feature of this particular stone however when we talk about the speciality of the stupas the stupas were actually constructed by the bricks they were not using the stones initially they were constructed by the bricks however the innermost part of the stupa that will be that would be comparatively made of the softer or the mud bricks and the outer parts the coverage etc that will be covered with the mud bricks uh, sorry co covered with the burnt bricks now when we talk about the popular art we have the rock cut caves we have the northern black polished wares okay the nbpw pottery we will study about it in detail in tomorrow's lecture and we also have the sculptures the various sculptures belonging to the you know particularly the dts related to the folk right related to the common folks for example the yaksh or yakshinis these type of uh, folk dts they are found now when we proceed further and try to see the pillar architecture in detail then we can say that pillar architecture basically if we talk about the pillars of the mauryan empire they take the position as uh, probably the most significant evidence of the existing of the empire not only that but also the pillars have the clear cut instructions okay written on written in the form of inscriptions on the pillar surface not only that these inscriptions on the pillar surface they provide the clear evidence that ashoka had a direct influence a direct impact upon the subjects of his state in fact if we talk about the language of the you know inscriptions which are mentioned on the pillar then we have that mostly ashokan pillars edict were in the pali and prakrit language but few of them were also written in the greek or aramaic okay particularly the pillars which we have found in the northwestern region of the ashoka's empire in the gandhar region right in the kandahar region particularly those pillars appear to have the bilingual inscriptions but here 
maximum number of pillars which are found in the gangetic planes they are written in the brahmi script mentioning the pali language which is belonging to the prakrit subsect okay remember that so prakrit is basically language pali is the you know a subsect or you can say a vernacular dialect within the prakrit language right if we try to understand the architecture here you can just see this picture very clearly i think it's visible to all of you that uh, the topmost part is basically the ashokan chakra and remember one point in our national emblem we don't have this chakra this chakra has got 32 spokes okay everyone and it is the central chakra located here which has got 24 spokes as found in our national flag and national emblem now this portion is taken as the national emblem of india this portion is taken as the national emblem of india so here this is called as the finial finial means the top of the the top of the building is basically finial okay then this portion is called abacus abacus is basically the circular base on which we have the animal figure right installed then we have the right the persepolitan bell now this is called as the persepolitan bell however however to me as well as several other people and to several other scholars also this appears like an inverted lotus inverted lotus right everyone so it might be regarded as an embellishment might be regarded regarded as the persepolitan bell or might be regarded as an inverted lotus so this is the next part and here in the last we have the proper monolithic shaft sing, no, that is carved out of a single stone having extremely shiny and lustrous polish and the length as well as the entire dimension of this pillar structure that varies somewhere around 15 meters and not only that not only that if we talk about the weight of this entire or the mass of this entire structure that that goes around 18 to 20 tons okay that basically depends that basically depends however when we talk about uh, the other features right remember that if we talk about other features here as i told you the name of the major parts shaft capital abacus and the capital figure or finial remember these parts very very important right these are very very important parts so this is written here you can simply go through once you are able to download the pdf that i will be providing in my telegram channel okay everyone so when you have understood the pillars let me tell you that these pillars historians like vincent arthur smith they claim that uh, these pillars are inspired by the persian achaemenid pillars the king of persian that the king of persian empire they also installed such pillars in fact several in numbers across their empire throughout their empire but let me tell you one thing if we talk about the pillars of persian empire and the Mauryan empire under ashoka we have both some similarities as well as striking differences when we talk about the similarities let me tell you these similarities are mostly ideological not architectural but ideological for example if you see the polished stones and motif now the stone polishing that can be common in any two architectures even if you compare the ashoka's architecture with the greek architecture even they might have the common similarity as the both of them might be using the polished stones so that is not very significant similarity however the use of motif now that seems quite striking because uh, ashoka also used the motif of animals 
which might be indicative of uh, more than one thing as per the perception of mind during Ashoka's period. Similarly, when we talk about the you know inspiration of the Ashokan pillars, basically Ashoka inspired you know, he installed those pillars to give certain instructions to his people. That is why the pillars of Ashoka they bear inscriptions. Similarly, the pillars of the Achaemenid Empire as well they also bear certain inscriptions. And when we talk about the uh, pattern of language, Ashoka has described himself in a third person communication form. Okay? Same thing has been done by the Persian Empire. Now, some of you might be watching the video and might be thinking that, sir, why are you saying like that? Can't it be, right? Can't it be in the opposite way that if uh, Ashoka might have a uh, constructed these pillars earlier and a Persian empire might have taken inspiration? No, because we are talking about the pillars in Persia which were definitely, definitely installed earlier than the Maurya's empire because we have the historical evidences for that. All right. However, when you look at this particular pillar carefully, look at this one. This is just a prototype. So, you have to basically look at the design. Okay. The length of this pillar that could be extremely long. Okay, so this is just the prototype. The main focus that is the abacus on which the animals are kept, and the combination you can see here. This appears absolutely, absolutely, yet absolutely imaginary. Nobody can say that there is a real animal which appears like that in which the bull is basically uh, having you know the head on both of its sides that's not even possible right but as compared to this pillar when you see the ashokan pillars the motif of animals represented in the ashokan pillars they are very much realistic very much realistic in fact the lions at a vaishali pillar inscription or the bull at uh, Rampurva pillar inscription or the quartet of lions at Sarnath, they are all extremely good looking, extremely valorous in their appearance as well as having the, having the strong presence on the monument. They are very realistic pictures, unlike this which is simply the imagination of the artist. Now, moving further, when we talk about the differences, there are many. There are many differences. For example, have a look on this one. The capital figure, as I told you, basically the capital figure that was absent in the modern, uh, certain modern pillars. For example, we do not have the capital figure or the animal figure on the top of the pillar at several places. At several places. For example, we have the you know, pillars at uh, Kumharar. Right, pillars at Kumharar. We have uh, the pillars at uh, Lauria Ariraj and Nandangarh. Not only that, we also have the pillar at uh, Koshambi. These pillars they do not carry, they do not bear the animal figure head on the top of it. Okay? So, not all Ashokan pillars are having the animal figure head on the top of it. Some of them they are having, the others they do not. Then we talk about the shape and the ornamentation. Now guys, have a look on both the pillars once again. If you have a look on both the pillars, you can understand it very clearly. The shape and the ornamentation, Ashoka's pillar, it appears relatively simple, relatively smooth. But when we talk about the Persian pillar, this pillar is highly intricate as well as having a lots of uh, design modifications to provide it a more rich looks as compared to the Ashokan pillars. However, the Ashokan pillars, they are having the smooth luster which makes them more attractive in the visibility. Okay? Now, when we talk about the other features, so basically the surface of the pillar as I told you, 
we have the rallies right we have the rallies are uh, we have the you know parallel grills on the surface of a persian pillar whereas the ashokan pillars are comparatively in fact completely smooth absolutely smooth when, when we talk about some other differences we can say that ashokan pillars whenever we have ashokan pillars or wherever we have ashokan pillar is a single structure that is a single structure whereas the persian pillars they are present in the clusters in the groups they are present in the groups not only that when we talk about the structure of the shaft guys have a look on this one that unlike the mauryan shaft which are monolithic structures the achaemenian shafts were built of the separate segments of the stone that means basically ashoka's pillars are constructed out of a single rock piece whereas the persian pillars they have the multiple rock pieces joined mechanically by making the specific shapes and uh, making them fit into each other so that is the feature that is the speciality of the persian pillars all right everyone now when we are talking about pillars let me tell you that in ashoka's pillar inscriptions we have two different types of pillar inscriptions the major pillar inscription as well as the minor pillar inscription okay so there are total seven number of edicts what is this uh, statement exactly meaning seven edicts means there are total seven instructions 1 2 3 4 6 right up to 7 and these are present at how many places then we try to categorize it into the major and minor on the basis of the number of inscriptions present on the major and minor of course those which are having the you know complete comparatively more number of edicts they are called major and lesser number of edicts are called minor one for example where do you have the major inscriptions or major edicts in the pillar sarnath lion capital that is a major pillar inscription okay however we also have the information that certain historians they claim that it was originally a minor pillar inscription but this claim is obviously disputed so therefore you will see that in different books you will realize that sarnath will be regarded either as a minor pillar or as a major pillar there will be always the difference so sarnath usually we should avoid writing the example of sarnath when we uh, are when we are questioned about the major pillar inscriptions however vaishali sankisa laurya araraj laurya nandangarh all these pillars they are the major pillar inscriptions they are the major pillar inscriptions all right everyone even same is applicable to the koshambi right koshambi the koshambi pillar inscription or called as the alhabad pillar inscription also known as the prayag prashasti of uh, another ruler great ruler samudragupta this particular pillar also has got a lot of inscriptions present on that however when we talk about the minor pillar inscriptions we have comparatively very less numbers rumendei and nigali sagar right in fact as i told you if we just consider the queen's edict at the koshambi pillar inscription even that can also be categorized as the minor pillar inscription all right everyone so these two pillars of sarnath and koshambi they are technically minor pillar inscriptions however due to the increasing number of the inscriptions on the later times they have been put under the major by various other scholars of the history right everyone however rs sharma he regards koshambi as well as uh, you know this uh, sarnath both into the minor so that is the point that i want to be very clear about now when we talk about uh, the edicts or the inscriptions of ashoka they are well known they are famous for certain specific animal figures sometimes even in the examination they ask about the animal figures so guys let me tell you very clearly vaishali pillar has got the single lion okay everyone sarnath pillar has got the quartet of lion that means four lions sitting with the back towards each other then we have uh, the pillar 
located near Sachi. Okay, that is not mentioned in this list. Okay, that pillar also has got four. That means the quartet of the lions. Then we have the pillar at uh, you know Lauria, Araraj and Lauria Nandangar. Now let me tell you, these two are devoid. These two are devoid of any particular animal. However, the pillar at Rampurva, the pillar at Rampurva near Vaishali, that has got a bull that is at the peak of the pillar. And similarly, when we talk about uh, the very, very special pillar that is uh, located at Sankisa, Sankisa is in Uttar Pradesh near Farukhabad. Now, that particular picture you can see here behind me. In this picture, I hope that nobody can even recognize that this was an elephant. This was an elephant whose trunk is uh, broken due to you know the wear and tear, of course. But this particular elephant figure is probably the only elephant figure which we can find on, on the main finial or the proper finial of the Ashokan pillars. All right, everyone. That is about the pillars inscription of Ashokas. Now, when we talk about the second major feature of the court architecture, I hope in the pillar architecture there is no question or no doubt. In case if you have any doubts or any queries or any complaints, then do not hesitate to drop the comments in the comment box because uh, it is very common that sometimes we might have the different sources to study the history and there might be the conflict of the opinions. But let me tell you that of course, there are always some more accepted and some less accepted opinions among the scholars. Now, when we talk about the stupa architecture, let me make it very clear to all of you that stupa. Now, there was a question in UPSC related to the stupas. In fact, in 2022 only, the question sta uh, it is stated that it is stated that the stupas have right the stupas have their origin related to the Buddhism or something like that only the statement was probably meaning that there was no such concept of a stupa before the origin of the Buddhism. Now, many people might be thinking that yes, of course, it is correct because the stupas are related to the Buddhism. No, this statement was considered as wrong. Okay. Here, let me tell you the concept of the stupa that did not originate only in connection with the Buddhism. The stupas are equally important not only for Buddhism but also for the Jainism as well as for the Brahmanism. Okay? In fact, in the Vedic culture also we find the references where the sages and the seers, they were not cremated, rather their ashes and their body remains were buried and then a mound was created it was to to make them a memorable right a memorable figure or to have the reminder of that person that is why we must be very careful while attending these type of questions okay now the picture that you can see behind me probably uh, tells you about the stupa as you can see here behind me this particular structure this particular structure which is uh, constructed on the gate itself this is called as a toran. Okay, everyone. The entry gate decoration is called as a toran. Then we can see the stairs going on the top of the first floor of the stupa. Now the stairs they are called as a sopan. They are called as a sopan. Then we have got this uh, boundary line, you know, this boundary line and the railings. Boundary line and the railings. You can see the railings. Now, these are called as a Vedika. Railings are called as the Vedika. Okay, everyone. Then you might be very clearly understanding that when we are seeing the railings here, there is the space. There is the space between the body of the stupa and the railing. Now, that space between the railing and the stupa, that space is called as the 
प्रदक्षिणा ओके प्रदक्षिणा एंड सम ऑफ यू राइट सम ऑफ यू माइट बी नोइंग इट विद अ डिफरेंट नेम बट दैट इज प्रदक्षिणा हाउ एवर वेन वी मूव फर्दर वी सी दिस ह्यूज हाफ एग लाइक यू नो हेमिस्फेरिकल स्ट्रक्चर दिस इज कॉल्ड एज अंडा कॉल्ड एज अंडा ऑल एट एवरी वन सो वेदिका इज देयर देन प्रदक्षिणा इज देयर देन अंडा इज देयर and on the top of the anda you can see a box like a structure which is kept atop okay everyone now here let me tell you this is called as hermika and over the top of the hermika you can see the chhatra okay and then here this staff is called as a yashti Call as yasti, right, everyone? So I hope that you got the basic names very clearly. These are the basic features of the stupa architecture, all right, everyone? And apart from that, when we come across the descriptive detailings here, you can see that even the pillars of this uh, right toran, even they have the extremely good-looking sculpture art. You can see the. presence of the yakshas okay the presence of the yakshas here here you can see the presence of the stupa you can see these are the different uh, bodhisattvas right bodhisattvas all this now you will you will you know feel wondrous you will feel wondrous that how can we right how can we say that uh, bodhi sattvas are presented represented here how can we say that because this sculpture was or this statue uh, sorry stupa was constructed by ashoka and during that period of ashoka there was no concept of the bodhi sattva then how are you saying that it is because my dear the stupa of uh, sanchi this is the picture of the stupa of sanchi this stupa was not fully constructed not fully decorated during the period of ashoka ashoka had only constructed this simple brick structure only that much but in the later subsequent periods we would see the further elaboration the further emancipation and the decoration of the buddhist stupa architecture and therefore my dear let me tell you that when we talk uh, talk about the stupas there was a question in the upsc prelims examination from this particular topic on the topic on the type of the stupas on the types or the categories of the stupas now let me tell you there are total three different types of the stupas the first one that is called as the sharirik stupa then second one is called as the prati uh, sorry paribhogika called the paribhogika and the third one is called as uddeshika so remember the name repeat after me sharirik paribhogika and uddeshika these are the th th three types of the stupas three types based upon based upon what criteria were they constructed for that is the main. okay everyone now when we talk about the sharirik stupa basically the various buddhist figures right such as uh, sariputra mahamoggalayan or you know such uh, lo you know loving disciples of lord buddha when we talk about these type of stupas they have the enclosed of the mortal remains for example sachi stupa has the mortal remains of the sariputta of the sariputta and that's why it is a sharirik stupa some of the stupas they also might have the mortal remains of lord buddha himself for example it is claimed it is claimed that in sri lanka there is a place called kandy okay kandy is a very famous place in the kandy we have a giant stupa where we have the teeth or particularly one tooth i hope the tooth of lord buddha kept in the form of the sharirik enclosure or the sharirik that means the bodily enclosure of buddha okay so that is very important to understand 
देन वी हैव द परिभोगिका वट इज दिस परिभोगिका परिभोगिका बेसिकली द कास्केट इज एनक्लोज द वेरियस ऑब्जेक्ट एंड यूटेंसिल्स यूज बाय द बुद्धिस्ट मॉक्स और द टीचर्स ओके so suppose uh, this is my pen and i am a buddhist monk so after my death what will happen they will just take this pen right take this pen and they will keep in a casket and then they will start building the huge monument over it saying that it contains the last bodily remains or the last you know products or the things which was touched by me that is the importance na no? bhai After all, Lord Buddha was so popular that if somebody tells that okay, this was the you know last place where Lord Lord Buddha used his wooden sandals, right? Wooden sandals or kharau. Now that kharau will become super important for all the Buddhist aspirants, right? That's why it was very very important. Now, apart from that, the third one is called Uddeshika. Now, what is that Uddeshika? Now remember, this is very very crucial. used for the worship purpose very important point to understand stupas are rarely used for the worship purpose but when we have the uddeshika stupa present laid mostly present in the backyard of the huge chaitya structures however initially they were constructed in secluded places during the modern period now these are called as the uddeshika stupas okay everyone total there were let me tell you total there were eight stupas which were con you know constructed during the immediate death of lord buddha so they are eight sharirik chaityas they were constructed at the eight centers rajgrih vaishali kapilavastu then allakappa ramnagaram uh, sorry ramagram then uh, vetadeep pawa and kushinagar okay everyone these are the places where we have the uddeshika stupas uddeshika stupa right sorry not uddeshika initial stupas early stupas okay i was actually thinking about the uddeshika so this uddeshika word came out of my mouth but i mean to say that these were the eight earliest stupas constructed immediately or within few years immediately after the death of Lord Buddha in 483, 483. That is obviously BC. Then, if we talk about uh, the classification of the stupa based upon the form and the function, that means what is the purpose or for which purpose were they constructed? Now, the purpose, the first type of stupa that is the relic stupa. Relic means what? Bodily remains, isn't it? The name itself is very clear. Okay. relic stupa means where certain uh, you know details certain features or certain remains of the body of buddha or his uh, products articles etc anything that was kept that's called as the relic stupa but when the same relic stupa when it has no body remain but it has certain object related to the life of buddha or any famous buddhist monk then this is called as the object stupa right everyone i hope it is clear to all of you okay dan patram or the robe angavastram or uh, sometimes you know any 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 small things like the nails right nails also are very very important okay now apart from that we have the commemorative stupas what is the meaning of commemorative stupa built to commemorate the events in the life of buddha and disciples suppose if uh, ashoka went to lumbini ashoka suppose he went to lumbini and in lumbini what did he do he got repaired a pre existing stupa now that repaired stupa that brings her name that ashoka came here in the 8th renal year and uh, he order for the reconstruction of this humongous monument okay such was the such was the commemorative stupa then there was the votive stupa what is this votive stupa by the way constructed to commemorate visits or gain spiritual benefits usually at the site of prominent stupas okay everyone commemorate the visit of particular 
ruler or particular seer that depends. So, what is the difference between commemorative stupa and the votive stupa? What is the difference exactly? Have a look. Commemorate events in the life of Buddha, okay, or his disciple, or his disciple only. Buddha or his disciple only, nobody else. Whereas in the votive stupa, constructed to commemorate the visits or to gain the spiritual fit, uh, benefits, usually at the site of the prominent stupas which are regularly visited. Here, does it say that what if stupa will be related only to the life of Buddha? Does it say like that? I do not think so. I do not think so. It does not say like that. So that means what? That means the what if stupas are basically constructed right, to commemorate the you know other types of the other type of the visits or the gains. What is the other type of visit to gain? other than Buddha himself, if anybody else remembers or anybody else does it, commemorate it. Sorry, what if, what if. So, overall there are, there are overall four different types, but let me tell you that there is a fifth type also and the guy's fifth type is basically called as the symbolic stupa. Now, what is the symbolic stupa? Does it uh, make even sense? Of course, symbolic stupa means to symbolize the aspects of Buddha and Buddhist theology. For example, Borobudur, it has got, you know, it has got the different layers of the, different layers of the roof coming to a common conclusion. Okay. So, here, basically it is uh, considered as the symbol of Dhatu, Bhumi, right. Dhatu and Bhumi and Buddha and Buddha himself. Dhatu, Bhumi and Buddha himself, three distinct elements. Okay? So, that is the basically purpose of symbolic stupa. It can be symbolic of anything. For example, if tomorrow there is a person who makes a stupa in the symbol of Buddha leaving his house to become an ascetic, okay? that can be possible, that can be possible right now. Now, so guys, when we have studied about the stupas, when we have studied about the pillars quite comprehensively, then I urge to all of you to have a look on this program P2I and if you really want to proceed further in your preparation journey, then have a serious consideration for the prelims to interview program of study IQ because this has to be, hands down, this has to be one of the best value on return type of uh, expenses that you will be making if you purchase or if you uh, register this particular program in a very nominal price of 29,999, then it is possible for you to have this particular discount with the help of my code ASR live. Okay, everyone. And for the sake of the content of this particular session, you can join me on my telegram channel. This is the link given here and uh, also, you can scan this QR code to join my channel. So, guys, thank you so much for watching it. Let us meet tomorrow and tomorrow we will cover the popular arts or the folk arts during the Mauryan period. Till then, take care everybody. Bye-bye. Jai Hind.